Robert H. G O D D A R D. Goddard. Goddard. Mm -hmm. Goddard. Okay, um, so he was a professor of physics, a uh, scientist, and he was a pioneer of controlled liquid fueled rocketry. He launched the first liquid fueled rocket on March 16, 1926. And from 1930 to 1935, he launched rockets that attained speeds of up to 550 miles per hour. His work was revolutionary, but he was made fun of because it was with rockets and everybody thought he was a nut. Um, so, he was born in Massachusetts in 1882, and he was the only child in his family to live to adulthood. Sad. Uh, and when electric power was introduced to American cities, he became really interested in science. Uh, when he was five years old, his father showed him how to generate static electricity on the family's carpet, and his imagination was inspired. He started experimenting, believing that he could jump higher if the zinc in batteries could somehow be charged with static electricity. Oops. The experiments failed, but he still kept working on it. Um, he eventually developed a fascination with flight, first with kites and then with balloons. He was really good at keeping a diary and documented all his work, a skill that would later benefit his career. He attempted to construct a balloon made of aluminum, shaping the raw metal in his home workshop. After nearly five weeks working and documenting, he finally abandoned the project. But this did not restrain his growing determination and confidence in his work. He became interested in space at the age 16 when he read War The War of the Worlds. His dedication to rocketry became fixed on October 19, 1899. He said, on the afternoon of October 19, 1899, I climbed the tall cherry tree and armed with a saw, which I still have, and a hatchet, started to trim the dead limbs from the cherry tree. It was one of the quiet, colorful afternoons of sheer beauty, which we have in, the, in October in New England. And as I looked towards the fields at the east, I imagined how wonderful it would be to make some device which had even the possibility of ascending to Mars. It, I was a different boy when I descended from the tree. And from when I ascended for existence, <coughs> at last seemed very purposeful. Um, okay, he was a really sick child. He was always having stomach issues or coughs. And because of that, he fell behind two years behind his schoolmates. So, but during the time he was sick, he went to the library almost every day and read the, and got the big, thick books on the physical sciences. Um, he went back to school at age 18 as a sophomore. After he graduated, he went to college and became a lab assistant to the head of the physics department. He received his Bachelor of Science degree and then went on to get his master's and doctorate degrees. While working at Clark University, he investigated the effects of radio waves on insulators and invented a vacuum tube that operated like a cathode ray tube. This was the first use of, vacuum tube, of a vacuum tube to amplify a signal. By 1913, he had in his spare time using calculus developed the mathematics which allowed him to calculate the position and velocity of a rocket in vertical flight. Given the weight of his rocket and weight of the propellant and the velocity of the exhaust gases, his first goal was to build a sounding rocket with which to study the atmosphere. He was afraid to admit that his ultimate goal was spaceflight, since the scientists, in America especially, did not consider such a pursuit to be real science, and the public was not ready to seriously accept it. He got really sick and had to quit working at the university and return to his hometown to recover. It was during this recovery time that he began to produce his most important work. In 1914, he patented two patents that would become important milestones in the history of rocket science. The first one described a multi-stage rocket. The second described a rocket fueled with gas and liquid nitrous, ox nitrous oxide. Uh, not all of his early work was geared towards space travel. He developed the basic idea of the bazooka under an army contract. Late, late another, uh, later, another researcher continued Goddard's work on the bazooka, leading to the weapon used in World War II. Yeah. Uh, most of his work was widely criticized and made fun of by the newspapers and other scientists. Because of this, he stayed away from publicity and only shared his ideas with a small group of people he trusted. 
Um, he began experimenting with liquid oxygen and liquid fueled rockets in September 1921, and Bench tested the first liquid fueled engine in November of 1923. It, uh, it had a cylindrical combustion chamber using impeding jets of, to mix and uh, atomize liquid oxygen and gasoline. He launched the first liquid fueled rocket on March 16, 1926. The rocket rose only 41 feet during a two and a half second flight, but its demonstration, but it demonstrated that liquid propellants were possible. The launch site is now a National Historic Landmark. That's what. Um, Goddard eventually moved moved to Roswell, New Mexico, where he could work with his team of technicians in near isolation and secrecy for a dozen years. Here they could not be bothered by the curious as he was beginning to gain some popularity with the people, and they also had a lot of space so that they would not endanger anyone. It was here that he added smooth casings and fins to his rockets. He began experimenting with gyroscopic guidance and made an unsuccessful flight test of such a system in, 18, in April of 1932. The gyroscope mounted on gimbals controlling steered vanes in the exhaust similar to the system used by the German V-2 over 10 years later. Between 1936 and 1939, Goddard began work on the K and L series rockets, which were much more massive and designed to reach very high altitude. It wasn't working so well, so he returned to a smaller design, the L-13, and it reached 2.7 kilometers, which was the highest of any of his rockets. Goddard was only able to flight test a few of his rockets. Most of his work involved static tests. Between 1930 and 1945, only 31 rockets were launched. And here's his documents. Um, though Goddard brought his work in rocketry to the attention of the U.S. Army, he was dismissed since the Army largely failed to grasp the, the military application of large rockets. German military intelligence had once paid attention to Goddard's work and even sent a spy to watch one of his rocket launches. There is some speculation about whether or not the Germans stole Goddard's work and used it to create the V-2 rocket used in 1939. He believed, they had he believed they had stolen his work, but it was never proven. Toward the end of his life, he realized he was no longer going to be able to make significant progress alone in his field. He joined the American Rocket Society, became a director, and made plans to work in the budding aerospace industry. He was diagnosed with throat cancer in 1945 and died later that year. His legacy includes 214 patents for his work, only 83 of which came while he was alive. The Goddard Space Flight Center, a NASA facility in Maryland, was established in 1959. The crater Goddard on the moon is also named after him. There are nu numerous schools named after him as well. On July 16, 17, 1969, the day after Apollo 11 landed on the moon, the New York Times published a short item under the headlines, A Correction, summarizing its 1920 editorial mocking Goddard and concluding, further investigation and experiments have confirmed the finding of Isaac Newton in the 17th century, and it is now definitely established that a rocket can function in a vacuum as well as, well as in an atmosphere. The times you regret the air. That's it. Anybody have any questions for Brayden?